Genesis 22, which can be found on page 240 and following in our Machsors, if you'd like to follow along. Let me just, I want to tell you a little bit about the Torah portion and why the rabbis of old chose this Torah portion for this day of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, it is obviously paired with yesterday's Torah portion of Genesis 21, which is the birth of Isaac. This is Akedat Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac, uh, where God tells Abraham to sacrifice uh, his son on Mount Moriah. Doesn't kind of doesn't make sense, but that's what God tells him tells uh, Abraham to do. What really doesn't make sense is Abraham doesn't say why or really just goes and does it. Uh, and so there's a lot of mystery to this story um, as to why Abraham would listen to such, such an outrageous command to sacrifice his son. Um, of course, I hope everyone knows the end of the story. He doesn't go through with it. God stays his hand at the very end, and Isaac is saved. And in place of Isaac, uh, God, um, Abraham, sacrifices a ram. Uh, and, of course, we sound the ram's horn uh, on Rosh Hashanah. So that is one of the primary reasons why this Torah portion is chosen for Rosh Hashanah, uh, that we, just like we sound the ram's horn on this day, we recall that act that both Abraham and Isaac did, by the way. Uh, one of the principles that the rabbis teach is called Zechut Avot, which is basically saying, like, don't forget I'm approaching you on Rosh Hashanah. I'm related to Abraham and Isaac and they went to extraordinary lengths for you. So if you could just remember that yechis on this day, uh, I'm kind of good. It's sort of like an extra entry into the door, um, an extra, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excelsior pass of ancient times. So, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't help it. So, <laughs> so that's, but that's really the principle of zechut avot, that you actually get in on sort of their shoulders in a, in a way, that you get a pass in some ways, that you get extra kudos uh, because of what they did and, uh, and our connection to them. I, I still find it quite mysterious that Abraham would listen to this, and I, I often wonder what did Abraham and Isaac talk about for three days? It was a three, days, three day journey. Like, what was that conversation? You know, what are we doing, Dad? I mean, what's going on here? Uh, and, w and so that was that silent car ride, I kind of imagine, when you, you know, did something wrong and you know, sort of no conversation in the car uh, for hours. But that was three days. The other thing to remember about this story, just a few, a few more notes before the cantor chants it, is that Sarah's not mentioned, which is quite remarkable. So Sarah, who was, gives birth to Isaac, um, in her old age, is not mentioned at all in the story. And actually, in the, the chapter that immediately follows this, Sarah dies. And even the ancient rabbis recognize, they even, they said she died of a broken heart because she discovered what her husband uh, almost uh, did to her beloved son. Uh, and so that's why the, her death immediately follows it. Uh, there is some contemporary Midrash and commentary that offers that Sarah found, woke up and discovered that Abraham and Isaac had run out early in the morning uh, to do this, and so she prayed to God, and that's why the ram appeared. It was in response to Sarah's plea and prayer, which that makes a lot of sense to me. The, the mother intercedes uh, when sort of uh, dad is getting overly zealous uh, in his faith, uh, and, and, sort of, and she, in a sense, and her prayer stays his hand uh, and prevents that from happening. So that's, that's Sarah. The other piece is this. Isaac and Abraham don't talk anymore um, after, the, after this. There is a rupture in their relationship. Uh, which, and that's, that's, I'm not, that's Torah. There's really no... And Isaac is quite silent throughout the rest of the Torah. He really doesn't speak much. Um, and in some ways... He is silenced by this, you know, extraordinary act that he endured um, as well as his father. Um, and so that, that is a whole other discussion as to what happens in their relationship and how zealousness and, 
you know, zealous faith can sometimes maybe get the better of us. And maybe this is the contemporary interpretation I'd like to leave you with. Maybe that, that you know, ruptures human relationships when some person is so single-minded uh, in, in their faith and in their zealous belief that it destroys the people that they are supposed to love and the people that they're supposed to hold close. Perhaps this story is a cautionary tale about where we're supposed to hold faith. Divine